everyone <laughs> and welcome to the latest episode of the read right to left podcast i am g joined by my always wonderful co-host ray from whimsical pictures hi guys and this month we are doing a very special series spotlight both for our my very wonderful co-host birthday um, but also <laughs> in celebration of our four years of doing this podcast. Can you believe that, Ray? That we've been sitting here talking about comics for that long? No, it's <laughs> surreal, honestly. <laughs> it's a bit horrifying. Let's be quite honest. Um, but today we are going to be talking about the oft-mentioned on this podcast, uh, phenomenal work, The Heart of Thomas, by Moto Hagio, a series that, um, not single-handedly, but certainly helped spur and the creation of the BL demographic and completely changed comics, um, especially within the shoujo sphere, uh, to what we now love today. Um, we have no questions mm -hmm. <laughs> this month. I think everyone was just far too excited to wish us a happy four years. Um, but also because <laughs> I think we talk about the series so, so often, I'm sure that <laughs> we've addressed many of the questions that have come up in the past about this particular series. Mm -hmm. So rather than answer any of any questions, we're going to be focusing specifically on the work itself, the characters, the theming, um, and hopefully, you guys enjoy. Uh, so I picked this topic for my birth month <laughs> uh, because, uh, of course, we've been talking about this series since our very first episode. It's one of my favorite manga of all time. Mm -hmm. It's probably my favorite Motohagio manga, uh, although that is a very uh, difficult competition. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... We have sort of talked about it before, but we haven't done specifically like a deep dive on this particular work. Mm -hmm. Even in our episode on Hagio's manga, um, we kind of brought it up, but didn't really talk about it in depth. Um, so I just wanted sort of an opportunity to have an entire episode to gush about how much this series means to me. <laughs> um <laughs> And what is so excellent about it? Um, so this manga, just to give a little bit of background on the work itself, uh, was originally published in 1974 mm -hmm. um, uh, through Shoujo Comic, I believe. Um, and... Like, the whole history behind it is very interesting, and the fact that it very nearly did not get finished because um, it was not very popular at first, like, dead last in the polls, mm -hmm. but then, like, the publishing of the Poe clan graphic novels and the fact that those sold out their print run immediately <laughs> um, led them to be like, okay, maybe we'll give you a little more time with this to finish it out, and then that was when it started, like, gaining in popularity. It's all really interesting. Mm -hmm. but, um, basically, this work came about uh, during a time when we had this editor working at Shoujo Comic called Junya Yamamoto, who, um, as the essay at the end of this book says, like sort of had a policy of just sort of taking things and publishing them without commentary mm -hmm. um, from this stable of... Uh, young female uh, voices that young me female mangaka that he considered to be very popular or not popular. I'm sorry. They weren't popular <laughs> yet. They weren't <laughs> popular yet. Um, he considered to be very talented and uh, bringing sort of a more literary aspect to their manga, which he was interested in. So during this era, when we have, shoujo comic sort of specifically trying to find these works that are going to be more literary in nature more out there more pushing the boundaries of what shoujo manga could be um we have sort of hagio and 
uh, another member of the Year 24 group, Keiko Takemiya, uh, who were roommates at the time, sharing a lot of influence, uh, learning a lot from each other. Specifically, Takemiya and their other roommate, uh, Norie Masayama. Huge Fujoshi, proto Fujoshi, I guess. Mm -hmm. But they're super into like Hermann Hesse novels. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. into like Bildungsroman. Mm -hmm. They're into like European movies about pretty gay boys. <laughs> and they are heavily proselytizing all this to Moto Hagio, who largely seems to respond to all of this with. I don't understand what's supposed to appeal to me about this. <laughs> 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 Until uh, she watches a French movie uh, by the name of, it's a 1964 film, uh, by the English title of The Special Friendship. Uh, it's a gay movie set in a boarding school. Tragic, you know. All those All that things. stuff. All the things that she likes. Uh <laughs> She thinks that it's just completely beautiful, super aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, and she decides to take a bunch of influence from that uh, into this sort of work that she starts just sort of doing for herself, mm -hmm. thinking that she's never, ever going to get this thing published. Um, but the opportunity comes along for her to submit something um, as sort of a longer serial work. Uh, so she starts off by submitting a 40-page one-shot version of what would later be The Heart of Thomas, which is called the November Gymnasium, mm -hmm. and ends up getting the opportunity from there to create The Heart of Thomas as a series. And there's so much more there, I had to take a minute to, <laughs> to think about like how much of it to deliver to y'all, but um, you know, if you are interested in the whole like history of the year 24 group and of Hagio. We've talked about it in our episode on her and our episode on the year 24 group. Mm -hmm. um, so go ahead and check those out if you want to. But yeah, uh, flash forward to 2013 and we finally get the work in English in a beautiful hardcover volume uh, from Fantagraphics. Um, with rumors now that maybe reprint eventually. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully fixed. Uh, hopefully uh, updated release. Um, because for yes. those who don't know, there was some issues, an older version or an older copy of uh, an unfinished like a copy rough draft, of basically. The, yeah, was what was sent to publishers. So although the book is beautiful, um, it is not. It's not a complete work in the way that um, the translator Rachel Thorne would have wanted, and she has mm -hmm. made it. Pr she is heavily alluded to reprints. Um, although when mm -hmm. that will happen, we do not know. We publishing is still in such a. Uh, tumultuous yeah. stage right now. Yep. And this is a, a very expensive type of book to produce mm -hmm. for not a whole lot of people buying it. So. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, heavily, like, collector's edition kind of thing mm -hmm. going on here. Mm -hmm. um, but I used this book to write my undergraduate thesis, so the binding's torn... And I would really like a new copy of Fantagraphics, <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> um, you don't even have to reprint it for everybody else. Just uh, sell one directly to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So getting into the plot of this book, uh, which is... As I think I just mentioned, three volumes long. Mm -hmm. um, the English version collects it into one omnibus volume, but it's three normal, like, tanko bone size books long. Um, and this is the story of a boy who begins the story by committing suicide. Uh, right on the first couple pages, we see him jump from the bridge above a train onto the tracks 
Um, and from there, we meet uh, a boy named Yuli, uh, who goes to a German boarding school. We're at a highly aesthetic <laughs> German boarding school. Um, <laughs> and this black haired boy named Yuli has just received a letter. Uh, he reads it only to find that this is the suicide letter from the boy who we had just watched jump in front of a train, a boy named Thomas Werner. Um, and the note says to Yuli one last time, this is my love. This is the sound of my heart. Surely you must understand. Um, now, Yuli has no idea why this kid might have killed himself and then sent the suicide letter to Yuli. Mm -hmm. But this is a boy who had just sort of confessed his love to Yuli in a very public uh, space and been very brutally shot down. Mm -hmm. um, because... Uh, it was all part of this sort of prank that was being pulled on Yuli, mostly, mm -hmm. um, but also on Thomas, as we find out. Um, but, uh, yeah, from there, we just sort of have Yuli and uh, his roommate, Oscar, trying to sort of unravel the mystery of why Thomas committed suicide in this way. Um which is deeply connected to Yuli's own personal trauma and the reason that he comes across so cold mm -hmm. um, to other students. Uh, and eventually we also meet our other main character, who is a boy named Eric, transfer student, um, who uh, is a lot less sweet than Thomas, but mm -hmm. bears a striking resemblance. They are pretty much doppelgangers. Um, so of course, Yuli feels very much like Thomas has come back to haunt him. And we go from there. <laughs> A lot more happens than <laughs> just stated in that, that plot synopsis. Mm -hmm. It's a whole lot of drama. It's a whole lot of trauma. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's a whole lot of boys loving boys. Yes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Ray mentioned her... Um, a little bit of her experience uh, writing her thesis um, with The Heart of Thomas. Um, uh, my, my experiences are not nearly as grand. Um, <laughs> they are just in fact... No, you can't read it. It's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> as probably expected for myself as someone who's had or has an interest in classic shoujo, um, who had previously read Hagio's work um, and who, you know, is does not bulk from the extreme prices of Fantagraphics manga. <laughs> um, when I was aware of, of Thomas, especially because of how formative it is for not only BL as a genre, but also as mong with manga as a whole. Um, Hagio's influence is throughout all of her works, um, but this one, as well as Poe Clan, really, I think, broke into wider audience appreciation. Um, obviously, she's had a huge amount of very popular titles over the course of her career, um, but this is, I think, one of the titles that people can hold up as, like, inarguably a classic. A classic of mm -hmm. manga, full stop, right? I, I would liken this yeah. particular work uh, to some of the most notable, you know, series that we see within lists of uh, influential manga like any of Tezuka's titles, um, you know, Adam or uh, yeah. Leiji Matsumoto, like those, this is a seminal work yeah. that is just, yeah. you, you cannot it's... fully understand the manga industry and the history of manga as a medium mm -hmm. 
without having read Thomas. You don't have to necessarily like it, but you yeah. you will not understand. <laughs> You'll be losing a lot of context. Yeah, if you're like if you're interested in manga as a medium in mm-hmm. its development and its history, this is absolutely a must read for mm-hmm. that version ver- uh, reason alone. Um, the influence from this title goes far and wide. Like the number of times you just be reading something and you're like, "Huh, mm. there's some there's some Thomas in here." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or you'll just like see a creator just like randomly name drop this manga. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's sort of in the same vein if we're talking about shoujo titles, of a, as a Rose of Versailles, right? Like, this is this is an incredibly mm-hmm. influential piece of media. Um, mm-hmm. All that to say, like, of course I was going to read this. What, who, what do you take me for? Um, even mm-hmm. outside of my personal interest and love of Hagia's work and interest in the Year 24 group and classic shoujo titles, of which we do not have very many of in English. Um, This was, when I was aware of it being released, um, it was like, of course I'm going to get this. this, It was not even a decision (laughs) of like, oh, should I? (laughs) No, yes, I'm going to buy this. It's, It's 65, or no, it's probably closer to 75 Australian at the time, which is <laughs> abhorrent for a singular book, but I've paid more mm-hmm. for less, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, all of that to say, um, I read it, I was aware of the history and the zeitgeist around Thomas, I was wa- aware of its influence and its impact, and even so, I was just blown away by how emotionally vulnerable, devastating, devastating, (laughs) vulnerable, um, this title is. I think, and I don't like making generalizations, but I think a lot of this era of current current day manga fans um especially those who um only have uh like a moderate experience or interest in shoujo manga in particular don't know how much tragedy (laughs) how much um (laughs) like that has existed within within the demographic uh since day one right Mm. Um, it's, and especially for this era of creators and this era of comics, um, there's certainly still drama, like, there's a lot of drama in shoujo manga, but the, the (laughs) heart-wrenching trauma and exploration of the human condition and the depiction of extremely broken people is something very unique to not just this title, but a lot of Hagia's work. And Mm -hmm. I don't think it is replicated or captured in the same way, even amidst her peers, right? Um, Mm -hmm. It's, there's just such a, so much of Hagia herself in her works that you can understand how a title like this can also really repel people um, because of that mm-hmm. that vulnerability and that, um, I guess, unflinching look at these characters. Um, and I think it really yeah. calls for an audience to examine themselves and to examine how they... I guess, participate with the media that they, they read um, and with the story and with these characters. Um, it really, I think, holds a, a magnifying glass to some of the worst aspects of the human condition 
and which can be really hard to read, you know. Um, in saying that, yeah, this is not an easy read <laughs> for probably a lot yeah. of people, and it's not meant to be. It's never was never meant to be. I don't think. Well, it's just like, um, particularly this particular era mm. of Hagio's work in particular, but also like shoujo manga as a whole. Um, if you've read like Glass Mask or The Rose of Versailles or something like that, mm. is very much it's very intentionally overwrought yes. in its drama. Um, it really is just like we're just gonna. Any emotion that our characters have, they are going to be having the most of that emotion. <laughs> and it's just going to explode all over the page in pretty bubbles and flowers. But mm -hmm. it's going to be heart-wrenching. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, like, you are going to be in it. Um, <laughs> and Hagio, like, her stuff, because of the way that she sort of you twists and uses the page layout to pull you deeper and deeper into her character's psyches. Mm -hmm. um, definitely reading her stuff, especially from this era, is uh, harrowing. <laughs> um, it's just a lot. Like, it's a lot. It's forcing you to wrestle with your own emotions mm -hmm. on a level of intensity that I think not a lot of, especially not a lot of, like, manga Yes. Um, not a lot of what is typically, like, genre fiction, typically, you know, aimed at children, aimed at teenagers, uh, aimed at readers looking for, like, an escapist experience, mm -hmm. um, are typically going for. Um, this is, like, a level of emotional experience that you have to be ready for and be willing to have uh -huh. going into the book, uh -huh. I feel like. Um... And that's not even getting into, like, you know, the specific topics that are being discussed here, mm -hmm. which um, uh, I guess content warning going forward, we will be sort of, uh, since we're deep diving into the book, we'll be spoiling the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, as we get further into the discussion, uh, that's going to mean we will be talking about uh, specifically um, sexual assault. Um and, like, I guess, emotional and sexual repression as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, as well as physical abuse. Uh, and um, we'll be getting into some, like, like uh, not healthy parent-child dynamics as well that are separate from the sexual stuff. Mm -hmm. um, those are the main ones. And suicide, yes, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um you know <laughs> because this is hagio and what's a hagio manga without a little trauma <laughs> so and before we dive into like specific characters specific story beats um following from your point of that that you made ray about that very close intimate examination because you do get drawn into the psyches of these characters um you're you're not invited into the psyches you are dragged in um you don't have a yeah. choice in that <laughs> um, but i i think it's it's interesting to see how comparatively to like manga is full of like extreme melodramatic emotional outbursts and you know it emotions mm. are very often portrayed larger than life because that's how you get an audience to understand the emotional state of a character which sometimes works which sometimes doesn't um but for this particular era of shoujo manga and specifically um as you mentioned that you know, within this era there's a lot of overwrought drama and trauma and this is not unique to Hagio but because of that very deep and uh, <laughs> that very deep look and and um almost forceful participation by the audience of these characters emotions 
it feels a lot more genuine than or mm. it doesn't I feel like it's more effective than when you just see a character going into a very melodramatic outburst <laughs> without having that extreme tie to the character um, or that yeah. extreme participation of the reader because you know I don't know how many times I've read something that's like meant to be this big moment and you know it's all drama <laughs> and everyone in the comic is like freaking out or you know celebrating <laughs> or whatever and I'm just like that's stupid that's hilarious why are you I don't feel this emotion at all um <laughs> well it's kind of like you know looking at like why it's so easy to meme like panels from something like the rose of versailles yes uh which i adore the rose of versailles like we'll talk about the rose of versailles that is on our list it, we'll get to it <laughs> don't you worry it's scheduled for the end of the um, year you guys don't have to wait too long <laughs> yeah yeah um so <laughs> uh but like why like it's so easy to take like a panel of someone like being like, mein Gott, from, like, the Rose of Versailles or something. Uh -huh. They wouldn't be speaking German. But um, there is one that I'm thinking of that's like, Kami <laughs> Sama! Sacre bleu! Um, and you're like, oh, okay. All right. And it's easy to, like, make a meme out of it. Like, oh, my God, me. <laughs> me for real. Mm -hmm. But, like, if you do that with, like, a character from the Heart of Thomas, it kind of feels a little more mean. <laughs> You're like, oh, well, oh. <laughs> I didn't realize we had bullies in this conversation. I don't uh, Yeah. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that you um, feel like it's okay to make fun of this traumatized child. <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, I, I don't understand why you think it's okay to tra to further traumatize this mentally ill minor, but go off, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it's a, uh, you know, it's a different vibe. It's a different vibe. Mm -hmm. Uh, it and it is it is Hagio herself. Like I feel like, you know, no matter which year twenty four artist you're going for, like they all have very very unique, mm -hmm. uh, sort of viewpoints and ways of seeing the world and ways of portraying the world um whether you're talking about Hagio or Takemiya or Oshima mm -hmm. or Kihara or Aoike or who have you um like they all have like very different like points of view mm -hmm. um and different things that they're like good at um and Hagio she's She's good at being raw, man. <laughs> um, just tearing, tearing apart the human soul to get at, you know, the, the seeds of the human condition mm -hmm. deep within the darkness of our psyches. She's, she's there for that. Um, and this manga definitely does that, so. And... With that, I think we should uh, dive into the <laughs> deep souls and psyche Ooh. of some of these characters. Yeah, so uh, I kind of wanted to structure our sort of discussion of the themes within the work by looking at each character mm -hmm. in turn, because this is a very character-focused work. Um, you know, going through the plot summary, you may gather... Uh, we're not heavy on lore here. <laughs> uh, this is, you know, a handful of boys in a German boarding school over a short period of time. Um, and their feelings. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> so... boarding school and vibes, but those vibes are just the worst vibes. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> But sometimes they're the best vibes, G, because this is a story about love, if nothing else. <laughs> um, and so we will sort of start at the tertiary and move towards the very heart of Thomas. Mm. Uh, we're going to start with Oscar, um, who is Yuli's 
roommate. Uh, he's a year older than the other kids because he sort of had spent uh, a year traveling around with his father after the death of his mother, <laughs> which we'll get into. <laughs> um, so he's a year older than the other kids. He's mm-hmm. taller. He's uh, more mature, both physically and emotionally. Um, and he's got it bad for Yuli. Um, he is just gay pining in the background of Yuli's entire school career. <laughs> Did the dog just bark? I maybe I didn't hear it, but copper copper is copper is also feeling the gay angst. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, sorry if that was caught on camera on. Um, whatever audacity (laughs) um but yeah so oscar's whole thing throughout the whole book um apart from sort of serving as like the mom friend Mm -hmm. (laughs) he's like a mix of the mom friend and like the cool aunt friend yeah he's um, kind of the (laughs) level-headed who lets you yeah uh, interjects. Who lets you try your alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, Eric starts a food fight. Who stops the food fight? It's Oscar. Um, you know. <laughs> Yuli keeps threatening to kill Eric. Oscar's like, all right, let's calm down for a second. Let's not kill <laughs> other students. I know this is not the most uh, structured of boarding schools, but we got... We... <laughs> Now let me tell you, kid, I've got a little more experience with murder than um, I think the other kids at the school do. <laughs> um, yeah, so his, you know, that's his thing. He's the mom friend. He's, like, helping keep things level-headed. Uh, but he's got his own ish, and it is a mountain of ish. Uh, he's got two dads. <laughs> um... So he's got his dad, Gustav, who um, he thought was his biological dad. He's, you know, been raised with him uh, and his mom his whole life Mm -hmm. uh, and had spent the year before coming to Schlotterbach Gymnasium um, traveling around with him. But uh, especially since coming to the gymnasium, he's realized that the headmaster of the school who took him in... um, Claiming to just be a friend of Gustav's is, in fact, his actual biological father. Um, Nobody knows that he knows that. He's kind of keeping it as his own little secret. Mm. He calls it his uh, his ace in the hole, um, his joker. Uh, But, um, yeah, and the other thing is that the reason he was traveling around for a year with his dad uh, before coming to the gymnasium is... That his dad murdered his mom. Yep. <laughs> um, because uh, she was, you know, that, being uh, the unfaithful. Yes. Uh, yep. And uh, yeah, uh, Oscar talks very matter of factly about this, as he tends to about most things. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you know, uh, I heard the gunshot ring out and. You know, not seconds afterward, my father told me, your mother is dead. Don't go in that room. Oh, so. my God. An accident occurred. <laughs> there, oh. <laughs> I think, A terrible accident. I think, Ray, you, you really um, <laughs> fucking clickbaited this whole, the, our whole audience when you said he had two dads. Um, and then immediately mm-hmm. just yeah. like, break <laughs> No, it, it's not gay, it's murder. It's not the good kind of two dads, it's the bad kind of two dads. <laughs> um, yeah, I do highly recommend the, uh, for those in the audience who read Japanese, um, the prequel manga, uh, The Visitor, Holmonsha, mm. is about Oscar's whole backstory. That one's really interesting because it really develops Helene, especially mm. as, like, a character. Um, she's, uh, all of the moms in this are sort of ciphers, which is something that you get a lot in, especially Hagio's earlier work. Mm -hmm. Um, and Helena, or Helene is not an exception to that. 
She's always shown in, like, these gorgeous Grecian dresses, even though, uh, ostensibly this is, like, the 60s or 70s. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, anyway, yeah, so Oscar, he, he acts cool, but there's a reason he's been acting out so much. He hardly ever shows up at class. He drinks a lot. He smokes a lot. Um... The teachers have no choice but to stand him because uh, he keeps the other kids in line. Mm -hmm. um, but he is going through it. Going through it. <laughs> Plus, also, like, if nothing else, I mean, he knows this, and his his the headmaster knows this. No one else knows it, but they're like they're not gonna kick out the son of the headmaster. It's not gonna ever happen, <laughs> right? So, yeah. There's a lot of rumors that go around among the other boys because it is, um, the headmaster thinks that he's the only one who knows that Oscar is his biological son. Mm -hmm. Um, but he gives Oscar very special treatment. Um, Oscar has a no interest dead loan from the headmaster to cover his living fees. Um, he gets to stay in the only, like, two-person room in the entire school with Yuli. Um, everyone else man, is in six-person dorm rooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, everyone else is like, oh, it's because he is the headmaster's favorite. Um, or they're like, oh, Yuli must have to babysit him. But it's like, Oscar knows that he's there to protect Yuli mm. because um, Yuli's been through this... Uh, traumatic experience and you know needs to it can't be sleeping with the other boys mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um because of his particular trauma um but uh oscar has all kinds of rumors around him um for being the headmaster's favorite being allowed to just chill with him in his library <laughs> whenever he wants <laughs> Um, but little do they know, it's because he is the headmaster's son. Um, Oscar is my little meow meow. Um, <laughs> my boy, my lad, my son. <laughs> uh, he's, because he's very passive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, as we've said, like, you know, throughout the whole thing, like, he's wielding knowledge as his weapon. Um, but he never lets slip how much he knows. He knows a lot more about what Yuli went through than he's willing to let on. Mm -hmm. um, and he knows a lot more about his situation with the headmaster than he's willing to let on. He also knows a lot more about what his, his uh, non-biological father did um, than he's willing to let on. Mm -hmm. Um, and he pretends that he's wielding this out of some sort of, like, trying to get power over other people, trying to sort of better his own position, uh, but he's actually just doing it because he's scared, um, understandably. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and he just, he doesn't know what to do with all these feelings and all these people that he doesn't want to hurt, that he loves so much, mm -hmm. um, and... So he just doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. He just sort of sits idly by. Um, well, especially and... because he's, although, like, he is older. He's older than the rest of the cast, but he's only 15. Like, these these are young kids, yep. right? So just although he... he is older and wiser in the ways of the world, he's He's not... got so many, he's got so many big feelings in his <laughs> chest. <laughs> <laughs> Especially towards Yuli and towards the headmaster. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of something he has to come to terms with. Is that he can't just sit around and be in love with Yuli without letting Yuli know that he's loved. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> what Yuli needs throughout all this time is to know that he's still capable of being loved. Not even worthy. Just mm -hmm. capable mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Because he's just assuming that he's this unlovable thing. Um, but he's got this roommate who 
thinks he's the bee's fucking knees over here. <laughs> and then, like, also, you know, the headmaster keeps, like, he's not sure if, like, he has any right to be like, hey, I want to adopt you. Mm-hmm. Um, not, like, because he feels like Oscar must be like, who's this weird guy in my life? Yeah. <laughs> Which is not how Oscar feels. He he feels like he loves this man and like wants him to be his dad. So, you know, um, that's sort of you know his whole journey throughout the book is figuring out how to open up with his feelings and know that he might end up hurting someone. Mm-hmm with the things that he knows, but that in the end, it's for the best Mm -hmm. to be honest with his feelings towards the people that he feels those things for. Yeah. And it's, it's something that, uh, we'll talk about in regards to Yuli as well, but learning how to express love, right. Um, and understanding Mm -hmm. what, that when you love people in every iteration of that word, you know, it's not just you that's impacted. Mm -hmm. Um, It's obviously an expression of very important and um, yeah, important feelings that can sometimes be so huge and scary and really does impact the people around you that in ways that can be very, very complicated to figure mm-hmm. out, especially yeah, especially at this age. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's something that I think every... The reason... And w- the reason that this s- particular... Um, Oscar as a character works so well is because although he's presented initially as this like kind of a little bit of a delinquent but also like that <laughs> the one friend who'll tell you like it is but also um the the one friend that you know grounds you brings you back to earth um and stops you from spiraling it's mm-hmm. a perfect expression of how the people that seem, I don't want to say put together, because again, like, he is cutting classes and drinking and, like, not, his life isn't put together in the way of, like, oh, he's, you know, head star, everything, perfect grades, in the way that a lot of, like, Japanese media tends to portray mm-hmm. put together characters. Um, but he is, he's certainly that, the, like, the f- cool friend. Like, the friend that everyone wants to be. Yeah. Um, and... The friend who's so adult. <laughs> yeah. Who's, who's like, for all of the other friend group, he's like, oh, man, I just want to be just like him. He's so cool. He's really got it together. Um, in how, in saying that, it, it's so important that he does have those really complicated feelings. Like, he doesn't. Like, nobody has it all all put together right like nobody's got it figured out we're all struggling in this big oh, this big marble cold earth um but i think it's so so easy to forget that or it's so easy to have like a quote-unquote cool character that doesn't have any issues and part of why oscar's story works so well in tandem with yuli and thomas and eric is that it shows like no matter what the perception the outside perception is that there's always complicated emotional important feelings things that people are going through um which i think a lot of people can relate to as well right so yeah uh oscar yeah (laughs) oscar oscar um also uh in terms of like tying in into sort of the next character we're going to talk about, which is Eric. Mm -hmm. Um, They're very much foils for each other, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Eric, you know, Oscar, 
looks old for his grade because he is. Eric looks young for his grade. Um, you know, that they're, they're very much there's this juxtaposition of youthfulness mm-hmm. and sort of maturity happening there. But also between like a more selfish version of love and a more selfless version mm-hmm. of love. And a more outward facing and more interior version of love, I think. Oscar, you know, if if, if Yuli's first roommate after like the incident with Siegfried had happened mm-hmm. was Eric, yeah. <laughs> nothing would have happened. Because, nah. <laughs> <sighs> like, so Oscar, for as much as we can say he's you know, needs to grow a bit of a spine towards the end of the story, right? Um, He is, like, he's a very emotionally intelligent kid, and he's really good at meeting people where they are. Um, And I think that um, that also places him in a very important spot within the story. So there's a lot of other kids in here who are like getting very up in their feelings and throwing <laughs> them at other people. Um, Oscar's not really like that. He mm-hmm. bottles things up too much, sure, but like he he very much like you know he's like I I don't want to tell Yuli how I feel mm-hmm. because I don't want to lose him. Yeah, but also because I don't want to break him. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like. He's, his, his love is very, it's coming from a place of, um, uh, it's a very selfless place. Yeah, he doesn't, um, he doesn't demand, um, the, the attention and I guess attraction in the same way that some of these other kids are like, no, you need to recognize <laughs> what I'm saying. I'm the most important person here. And I don't care how you <laughs> feel, because I understand you so much better than that other person. Uh, yeah, but, you know, they're kids. Of course. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm but, saying. You um, grown because they're like 14. You know, children. Yeah. <laughs> but even then, I like the, the sort of balance that comes in at the end, where it's like he, he realizes that, like, you know... There is sort of the selfish desire to just be acknowledged Mm -hmm. um, and have his feelings acknowledged by the other person Um, where he's just like, you know, I was just waiting for the headmaster to realize that I loved him Mm -hmm. and I was just waiting for Yuli to realize that I loved Mm -hmm. him. Um, But yeah, I think Oscar does like sort of occupy that more, that, that softer, gentler ground. Um, which is certainly something that Yuli needs, mm-hmm. uh, especially throughout the first part of the book. Um, you know, before he's ready to get pushed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of getting pushed. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about our little doppelganger. Mm. <laughs> um, Eric, I believe, is on the cover of the English edition. Mm-hmm. Um, there with Yuli in the background, uh, this curly brown hair. He shows up in front of Yuli. Yuli is like standing at Thomas's grave, uh, ripping his suicide note apart. <laughs> um, very dramatically. Yeah. And then this kid walks by who looks like Thomas's motherfucking ghost. Oh my god. Oh my god, he's come back to haunt me. He's come back to haunt me. Um, and Yuli, like, confronts him, like, you're back to haunt me, aren't you? And Eric's like, who the fuck are you? (laughs) (laughs) Mate, I don't know you. (laughs) Um... And then, lo and behold, he shows up to school the next day. <laughs> Isn't that all? Uh, he way? is the transfer student, <laughs> Eric Fruling. He is uh, 14 years old. He is a, a little firecracker. Thomas, we know, was a sweet little angel. Wouldn't hurt a fly. Eric loves fencing, loves cussing people out. He's <laughs> a little pain in the neck. 
Um, <laughs> um, he shows up. Yuli has already made it very clear to him that he wants absolutely fuck all to be with him. And Eric's like, you know what? Well, all right. <laughs> fuck you, too. <laughs> Uh, but of course, nothing is ever that simple. <laughs> um, because he looks just like the kid who just died last week. Oh my god. <laughs> Two weeks ago, yeah, I think. Wouldn't that be wild if like, a kid through some <laughs> horrible accident or suicide died, and then like a week, couple weeks later, there's just this, uh, this person with a striking resemblance... Um, Starts at your school, and you're like, oh, God, oh. Just show up. Yeah, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised Well, of course, he kids. is the talk of the school. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild, <laughs> but um, if you're familiar with Hagio's work at all, she loves her twins. She loves her cosmic twins. Yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they are twins in more than just appearance. Mm -hmm. Um... But, uh, yeah, so Eric, he shows up, um, the first thing that happened to him was he was outside a graveyard, and this, this prick wearing his school's uniform comes out and starts calling him Thomas and yelling at him <laughs> and tells him this kid Thomas killed himself, um, and then he gets to school the next day and... Not only is everyone saying that he looks just like Thomas, and he's just like Thomas, and oh my god, it's Thomas. Oh my god! Uh, but Thomas. also he finds out that this that this kid who yelled at him uh, is the prefect, and also lied to him because this kid just fell off the bridge. He didn't kill himself. Mm. Like, what's the real story here? <laughs> um... So, because the only one who knows that he committed suicide is Yuli and Oscar, because he let Oscar read the letter. Um, and, yeah, so, Eric's like, now I'm being accused of lying, <laughs> <laughs> making up lies about this dead kid, I'm just repeating what someone told me, I don't know. And, uh... He'd just really like to get to the bottom of what's happening here. Mm -hmm. Who this Thomas kid, who apparently looked just like him, is or was, what happened to him. Uh -huh. Why Yuli keeps glaring at him with murderous intent. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is Eric. Yep, yeah. He also starts a food fight on, like, his first day, so that's <laughs> The other thing about him is that he is uh, unhealthily attached to his mother, mm -hmm. Marie, mm -hmm. um, which is extremely subtly indicated by the uh, engagement ring on his finger, that his finger is too chubby, so he can't get it off. Mm -hmm. um, it's an engagement ring that his mother gave him. Um, <laughs> and... Um, just in case you didn't understand the metaphor, later on, uh, he has, like, you know, an epiphany and grows up a little bit as a character, and then he's like, I think I must be going through a growth spurt. I can take this ring off now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we never said it was a subtle book. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not... Well, I don't want to say the death of a parent is ever a good thing, but I feel like it probably helped uh, Eric in this situation a little bit to have some have some life experience outside of his mother. His mother is actually like not to bring in another Hagio series, but I am myself. So, um... <laughs> She reminds me a lot of the mother character in um, A Savage God Reigns. Zankoku no Kamigashi Haisuru. In that she's not like 
And we don't actually, like, we don't meet her face to face. We just hear about her through, like, Eric's recollections and memories and stuff. Um, so she's different from Sandra in that regard, mm. but a similar sort of character type in that she's not, like, outwardly abusive towards her child, mm. but <laughs> but she is maybe the kind of woman who had no business having children. Mm. <laughs> um... She's Eric even describes her as um, selfish and capricious. Um, she was, you know, not only was he unhealthily attached to her, I mean, that's just because she was very unhealthily attached to him. Yeah. Um, well, constantly being like, you're the only one who loves me. Mm-hmm. You know, as long as you're here, I can live. I, I can't live without you. You have to be here to keep me together. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, going through this, like, carousel of different horrendous boyfriends who just, we don't know much about them, but they're in and out. She's always with a different guy. She's always being like, oh, I think I want to see this lake in France. Let's go. (laughs) Um, not, not a super stable living situation with this woman. Yeah. uh, (laughs) The general, she's she's guest. she's the kind of person who wants needs kind of that unconditional love, that constant reassurance. Uh, somebody mm-hmm. loves her, but rather than getting a pet, uh, decided to have a child <laughs> and use that as her like, oh well, mm-hmm. they're my kid. They're obligated to love me, right? Um, it's yep. she sees she sees. Eric as an extension. I can't keep a man, but this child has no choice but to stay by my side. Exactly. <laughs> but she also sees Eric kind of as an extension of herself, right? Is that reassurance mm. of, you know, oh yes, I am worthy of, and people do love me. I, I'm not broken. You're broken. How dare you make that assumption <laughs> about me? And you're like, oh. As not, yeah, certainly then, not the the uh, relationship that you want to have with a parent or yeah. anyone, but especially not a parent. And then after raising uh, your son for so many years to believe that the only person that he can trust and believe in is her, mm. that he's dependent on her as she is dependent on him, that uh, every other love in his life will just desert him. Nothing is real except the love between him and his mother. Uh, Then, of course, she finds a man who actually does feel like sticking around and decides that now is the time to send her kid off to boarding school because, you know what, it's actually kind of a pain having this little jackass around to ruin Mm. everything. So, (laughs) and uh, this is where we find our boy. (laughs) (laughs) Which, again, Um, when you show up at this new school, new start, right? Like, oh, wow, I get to meet so many new people and hopefully make friends and learn some things about life. Well, because he had never been to any kind of school before because his mother couldn't bear to be apart from him Uh and was constantly schlupping off to other countries with him. Um, So he just had, like, a rotating stable of tutors um who like if he didn't like one of them she'd just replace the tutor Mm. so school uh with other boys and uh teachers who he can't talk back to a very new experience for him very new experience but also like okay fresh start get some worldly experience right maybe make some friends and then immediately Mm. everyone is like oh you look identical to that kid who just died like you can't even be (laughs) your own person (laughs) <laughs> she's like oh wow the, the 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 kid who we called Fräulein who seemed to like it mm. <laughs> the kid who we called Lebev the kid who you know all of the other boys like made a game out of infantilizing mm. right um yeah so uh just like Oscar we have another kid who uh is perfectly well adjusted and has no problems <laughs> in his life at all <laughs> 
Um, and there is a little sequel manga called By the Lakeside that uh, talks a bit about Eric that is also included in the book mm. uh, that has Whole Moon Shot, which is the one about Oscar. So, um, But yeah, so Eric, 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 that's his parent drama. <laughs> um, now we can talk about his drama with the other boys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, specifically Yuli, mm -hmm. uh, he, he comes into Yuli's life like a wrecking ball, um, and he, uh, I was sort of alluding to it earlier, but Eric is not just Thomas's sort of twin in terms of them looking exactly alike. But he sort of, in a way, shares Thomas's soul. Mm -hmm. um, in that he is someone who is capable of loving with his whole heart and his whole mind and his whole body. And he's capable of loving unconditionally mm -hmm. and powerfully and purely. Um, and this is something that he's sort of bringing into Yuli's life at a time when... Yuli is not willing to accept it, mm -hmm. but perhaps desperately needs it. Um, so, and in that way, he's a continuation of what Thomas had been trying to do. Um, literally sacrificing his own life to try to help Yuli realize that he is loved. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I kind of, I don't want to get too much into that until we get into Thomas as well, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of them overlapping, melding together, Eric being like, I'm not Thomas, but maybe I kind of am, and maybe that's okay. <laughs> um, in the last third of the book, it's very trippy. Uh, it's very Hagio. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before we get into that, we should get into Yuli mm -hmm. and all of his shit. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to make the note that ostensibly like this is a, a story about various characters but this is ostensibly your yuli's story um yes he is the main character insofar as the story mm -hmm. has a main character um obviously they're like although the series or the work is named after thomas it's only tangentially about thomas this is yuli's journey into himself mm -hmm. and addressing his own uh, his own issues um and yeah uh, we'll yeah. get into thomas but mm -hmm. he's really more of a concept yeah. than a character um but or i mean he is extremely central to the book yeah like there's a reason it's named after him he's but... a he's the catalyst to what this book is but he's not like it's not named after him because he is the central character no. <laughs> of the work. I mean, he dies on, like, page two. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, Yuli's the main character. He's he's the main boy. All three of these main, like, um, Oscar, Eric, and Yuli, they all have complete arcs mm -hmm. throughout the story. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Oscar and Eric... Their stories are very inseparably woven in with Yuli's journey, yes. and they play vital roles in pushing Yuli towards his inevitable conclusion. Um, so, which is why I kind of wanted to save Yuli for the end. Um, we're going to talk about Yuli, and then we're going to pull things together by talking about Thomas, because Thomas is sort of a personification of a lot of the major themes mm -hmm. of the story so uh to talk about the ending of the book is to talk about what the character of thomas actually means mm -hmm. for yuli mm -hmm. um so that's the that's the through line we're going for but yuli um he is the black-haired sort of prim perfect prefect um, he is rather famous around the school for having a big old stick up his ass. <laughs> um, he's 
Uh, everyone admires him. His grades are amazing. He, when he, you know, cants the hymns at mass, mm-hmm. he reads them oh so piously. Um, you know, he's he's a very special boy. <laughs> the best boy, Damn, even. He sings those uh, hymns so good. I wish I was he's So good, so... <laughs> piously (laughs) um but he keeps people at an arm's length um he never shows anyone love and never expects anyone to show him love Mm. he treats all of his friends exactly the same he claims that he's being fair but others might say that he is uh not allowing himself to have friends at all um and what we learn from Oscar uh, is that he was not always this way. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a particular spring break, I don't remember, um, summer break, whatever, where he uh, he had family issues at home, basically. He's got a little sister who's in and out of the hospital, so she was in the hospital. So there was no one at home, so he had to stay at the school. Everyone else was gone, except for a group of uh, upperclassmen who have a reputation about the school grounds. Mm -hmm. Um, And something happened uh, over the break that when Oscar came back, Yuli was not the same person that he was before. Mm -hmm. Um... He seemed to be in shock. And I mean, there, there's that part, you know, where like he like he sort of gives Yuli like a friendly nudge, like, hey, you should go hitchhiking with me next time. Mm-hmm. And Yuli just straight up falls down the stairs. Mm-hmm. Um, he's just like so in a daze. Um, and after that break. Not only has Yuli changed a lot, but he gets uh, suddenly moved into the two-person dorm room with Oscar, and the upperclassmen are all expelled for delinquent behavior. So, yeah. Um, (laughs) Given that we did give a list of trigger warnings uh, at the start of this discussion, Mm -hmm. it's not that difficult to surmise what happened i think Mm -hmm. um so he of course um had a very traumatizing experience with um sexual assault uh over this break um and is very much still in the process of recovering from that Mm -hmm. and healing from that just even processing processing what he's gone through yep Um, And the way that he's sort of surviving Mm -hmm. um, at the point when we begin our story is, yeah, just keeping everyone at a distance and not letting himself feel too much. So, Um, and uh, just to give a little bit more uh, necessary background, I think, on Yuli's character is... um, to talk about his family situation a little bit, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which uh, we get later on when Eric, um, you know, runs away from the school because his mom just died and Yuli has to cart him back home. And during that, he has to, uh, there's a mix up with the trains and he has to take Eric to stay over at his place for a night. Um, And, uh, Yuli is um, only half German. Uh, I mean, I think, like, in terms of citizenship, like, he's a full German. Yeah, like, yeah. his dad was also a German. But ethnic- <laughs> ethnic-wise. But his dad is... Yeah. Ethnicity-wise. Yeah. Um, he's... The reason that he has black hair is because his dad has some Greek in him. Um, so and they make a really big deal about this throughout the book like the kids at the school always say that he looks like one of the angels in a chapel painting um 
you know, like an angel of the Italian Renaissance. Mm-hmm. They say, oh, he looks Southern. Um, I mean, to an American reader, it's kind of like, what are you talking about? That's all white. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, not necessarily how Europe works. Yeah, and, definitely uh, not. The, um, yeah. Not also how, yeah. So, uh, but, so he has black hair, which marks him as visibly sort of more Mediterranean uh, in terms of his heritage, his ethnicity. Uh, That comes from his dad. His dad is dead. Mm -hmm. Um, But his dad was very much an overachiever. Um, Good at everything. Very much, I think, in the same way that Yuli does now, Mm -hmm. was uh, sort of trying to prove to the world that he was perfect enough to be worthy of being treated like a human being. Yeah, I mean, overcompensating um, or overachieving in order overcompensating to be to be recognized for yeah, as you said, as like a as a person, as a valued person. Worthy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and we see that Yuli's mother seems to be a lovely woman, but her mother is a piece of work. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, Yuli's father, just before dying, uh, had some failures in his business, mm-hmm. which left him in a lot of debt, mm-hmm. which his grandmother, his mother's mother, took on. Mm -hmm. Um, So now Yuli's mother feels very indebted to her mother Mm -hmm. um, financially. Um, And they they live together um, in his grandmother's house. And uh, his little sister has perfect little blonde curls. Mm -hmm. And his grandmother really loves those perfect little blonde curls and really doesn't think much of Yuli at all, Um, thinks that he's not German, thinks that he's, you know, well, she's very racist. Yeah, a racist German? (laughs) Who Um, perished the thought? Who, who the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) Um, in the 70s? Are you kidding? Um... Or a nebulous time before yeah, ne- 50s, 60s. Ne- it's very nebulous. Nebulous 20th century, uh, well, even <laughs> pre-war German. It's like, oh, who, hmm, hmm, this, this person who looks uh, very different from the general populace. <laughs> maybe, maybe differences aren't uh, a good thing. Oh, hmm. uh, I don't know. Yeah. And Yuli's mom is, you know, she's doing her best, but she's definitely not helping him with the overcompensation because she's like, look, Grandma, Yuli is a good boy. Look at his wonderful grades. (laughs) Which is definitely sending the message of, well, I'm worthless if I don't get these wonderful grades. Yeah, I must achieve (laughs) perfection in order to be recognized. Yeah, he literally says that. He's like, I will meet my ideal. Mm-hmm. I will meet it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and I'm like, sure you will, you 14-year-old child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's coming into the school with some baggage. And now he's gone through this horrifically traumatizing thing where, you know, not only is he made to feel that his body is dirty that um not only is he given physical scars that remind him of this this feeling that he's done something wrong Mm -hmm. um um but specifically the person who uh attacked him um had this really bizarre vendetta against religion and god and specifically used that humiliating experience to like humiliate him Mm -hmm. religiously Mm -hmm. by telling him to denounce his own god Mm -hmm. um and now like whenever he's there like reading the hymns he has to remember his trauma and be like i'm lying like i literally like i told this boy 
you know, who I thought I had a crush on, who I was drawn to, like, I told him, you know, I don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. I, you're my God. Because he was told to say that. He was made to say mm -hmm. that. Um, so, uh, which hopefully will help people maybe not get up in arms when we talk about the ending yeah. to Yuli's arc. Yeah, because, yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like it's easy to misunderstand mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. from a Western perspective. Uh, because the thing is, as well, like but, his his relationship with religion is, I mean, prior to his trauma and and just torture and the earlier in the the break is something that. Mm -hmm. uh, was he took great value in again part of that idealized mm -hmm. version of himself so he he's unable to forgive himself for failing as well um to meet those expectations and to build that to recognize that part of himself um which again goes to later in the story and his decision and why it's a big deal and why it might not translate for some people especially because we don't live in a society well a lot of western culture doesn't value religion as highly as as it, it societally is recognized in the period that this book is meant to be written in um or portraying i don't know it's uh there's also mm -hmm. like i don't know there is that um obviously hagio had done a lot of research mm -hmm. in terms of like Christianity and Christian imagery and stuff um, uh, in that there's like Bible verses and stuff yeah, strewn yeah. throughout this for dramatic effect but um, for the most part God and religion within this book serve the same purpose that they serve in a lot of Yuri to be honest yeah. like you know think of like Maria watches over us <laughs> like um, it's a symbol for love mm -hmm. right yeah um, and it's serving on that level a lot here where Yuli feels like, you know, he's had his angel's wings ripped out. He can't go to heaven. Yeah. He's not worthy of any kind of love. He can't be loved. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and Thomas sacrifices himself to give his wings to Yuli. So to give his love to Yuli so that Yuli can experience the heaven mm -hmm. of knowing that he's loved and being able to love other people freely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's Yuli. Uh, throughout the book, obviously, we have uh, multiple characters who love him so very much. Oscar has been pining for him this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Eric as well. Uh, obviously, Thomas loved him. Um, but Yuli thinks that that's not true. Well, I should say Yuli pretends to think that that's not true. Yeah. Um, he's not because he's not Thomas blind to, to things. Yeah, Thomas and his little slut friend Anta. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, who's just there? This story, you know, Hagio tried to rewrite it for. Um, uh, more like the typical shoujo audience of the time which like wasn't used to a lot of male protagonists mm -hmm. so she was like okay I'll just make them all girls <laughs> uh, which didn't work out she hated that but um, <laughs> this is very much like it's just a class S story yeah. it's just S Kanke but with the gender swapped mm -hmm. and Anta's the little the little bitch girl <laughs> <laughs> Anta's the little bitch girl who's just there to fuck shit up uh -huh. and kiss boys. <laughs> um, I love him. He's so chaotic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but him and Thomas were best friends, and Anta has this crush on Oscar, and feels like Thomas is. It feels like Yuli is in the way, but he knows that Thomas likes Yuli, mm -hmm. so he's like. I wonder which of us can get Yuli to say that he loves them. <laughs> um, 
trying to get Thomas to confess his feelings. Uh, and that works, but, like, the rumors spread around school that, like, it's just a prank. Yeah. A farce, yeah. they call it. Uh, that Anta and Thomas are just betting with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when Thomas says, like, you know, I like you, Yuli's like, you're lying to me that I know about the farce. This is stupid. I hate you. I don't feel anything about you. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what he says, right? He's like, I don't feel anything about you. Yeah. And it's like, damn, harsh. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, we, we have sort of the process throughout the whole thing where Yuli's like, I know Thomas didn't care about me because of this. He, he was just saying that because of this farce. Mm-hmm. Why would anyone love me? But then towards the end of the book, he finally has to come to terms with the fact that no, Thomas did love him. And Thomas knew about some of what had happened, mm-hmm. but he loved Yuli anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of him, you know, also realizing from other people that, like, Oscar knew all along, but Oscar loved him anyway. Yeah. And Eric yeah. now loves him, too. Yeah, they love him for the entirety of who he is and not the idealized mm-hmm. perfection that has been his, I guess, goal or what he's wanted to be able to mm-hmm. be his whole life because of all these the expectations of his grandmother yeah that these people they've seen right through him Mm -hmm. but he doesn't have to be scared of that Mm -hmm. because they love him anyway yeah (laughs) uh this is part where i tear up thinking about this stupid book (laughs) but (laughs) um but yeah um and in the end the end of the story he, he's got all these people, all these options, man, vying for his love. <laughs> Oscar has confessed his feelings. Eric has confessed his feelings. Of course, Thomas had it confessed his feelings and then fucking died. <laughs> uh, but Yuli, in true class S spirit, goes with um, his first love. He goes with Thomas. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thomas is dead. So, uh, what does this mean for Yuli? This means that he's gonna go become a priest. He's joining the <laughs> clergy, baby! Uh, he's joining the clergy! <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I want people to understand is that this is very obviously, like, a metaphorical marriage with Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not less gay because he went to become a priest. It is more gay. Yeah. It's, he wants it's, to become it's a rededicating himself <laughs> to his belief um, and his faith whilst acknowledging that he will never have feelings for another in the same way that he has feelings for Thomas, right? And for Thomas. And how do you how do you <laughs> have a relationship with someone who is passed on um, and and feel that connection? why it is through um, making the decision to just not never be in any other relationship aside from the overwhelming acceptance <laughs> of the church. <laughs> you, you never have to make a decision he's, he's... to get married or worry about any other kind of kind of romantic <laughs> relationships when you join the church although like obviously that's not true but like that is what it symbolizes <laughs> that is what it symbolizes in a work that's like what, this <laughs> that's what it means here um he leaves clutching uh thomas's beautiful love letter in his hand <laughs> thinking about how loved he is as he rides the train off into the sunset. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> Truly, he must um, be amongst the angels. And therefore, <laughs> I will join the church. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the, uh, he's the spiritual manifestation of the god of love, mm-hmm. Amor. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> um, yep. So, that's that um and Eric and Oscar are like hugging each other crying while he leaves and then I go on to ship those two together so 
vaguely supported in the sequel. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, it's 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 a very chaste love mm-hmm. that you see in this book uh, compared to something like um, Kaze Toki no Uta, because these are often considered sort of sister series, mm. um, both very formative in terms of establishing the BL genre. Mm-hmm. Or what would later become the BL mm-hmm. genre. Uh, but Kaze Toki no Uta is the slutty sister. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of boy kissing going on in here, but um, it's much more I think interested in. I mean, I think if you read any Hagio work, right? She's not interested so much in relationship types that can be easily defined. Yeah. Um, and this is no exception. So it's like, I don't know, I feel like I see people call it like too vague or whatever, but I feel like that's not necessarily fair to what the book is trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that in a book like this, the boundaries between romantic love and sexual love and spiritual love and familial love and friendship love are there are no boundaries yeah. it's just love yeah <laughs> um which even if you get later in her career where she is very like not shying away at all from um having queer sex scenes mm-hmm. it's still like what you've got characters who are like, what exactly is this relationship? I don't know, but I love him, mm-hmm. kind of thing. <laughs> um. So. Yeah, I love this book. <laughs> <laughs> um. I kind of wanted to talk about the sort of through line that we see through here, especially through Eric, because Eric and Thomas, we were going to talk about that, um, how Eric and Thomas sort of meld into each other Mm. as the book goes on. Um, they overlap with each other so much that at the, at the end of the day, Eric is like, Maybe I am Thomas. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe it doesn't matter. So, um, it, it's an interesting, surreal dynamic. Yeah, yeah. But um, in this way, we're sort of like, you know, Eric is still very much there as an individual, but he's also fully there as a metaphor, mm-hmm. representing the same things that Thomas does um this is also something Hakio does a lot where she'll have characters that are very much like themselves like very strongly written individual characters yeah. but also fully metaphors for something yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, and i'm always amazed by her ability to weave those into each other uh without it seeming like forced or fake mm-hmm. um um <laughs> Sometimes you're just, you know, a symbol of an abstract concept, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but what I like about what him and Thomas like keep repeating is this theme that shows up throughout Hagio's work that I think is one of the reasons that it appeals so strongly to the people who love her work. Mm-hmm. Um, which is this idea that, like, you know, we have no choice but to love other people Mm -hmm. because we're lonely. Mm -hmm. And it's like that sort of idea that, you know, it's inevitable that we are just all alone in the world. We feel alone at times. Mm -hmm. And that even though we know that love is going to, like, hurt us and we're gonna hurt other people by loving 
we do it anyway not even because we want to but because we have to Mm -hmm. to survive yes yeah just that that's um where a lot of i think the the core of like the vulnerability of her work Mm -hmm. comes from is like that people are weak Mm -hmm. and we get lonely and that's why we need each other Mm -hmm. and yeah to connect (laughs) to others is the human condition right like the experience Mm -hmm. of being a person and like honestly the most like valuable experience in our existence um is that connection with other people and Mm -hmm. like achievement in like obviously society measures achievement in all sorts of different ways but I think there's very few people in this world who would regard someone who has a strong care and a strong urge to understand and support and be with other people even if it's not like even if it's painful even if it's not an easy experience is always more of a achievement comparatively to like how much money you make or how much like money more status uh, qualities of achievement or status um, measurements of achievement is like it, it just we exist I'm getting all philosophical here we as people exist in community with others even if we don't always realize it we all exist in this world because of other people and to be able to nurture and support and connect with communities and and ourselves within the structure of society that that's why we seek out friendship that's why we seek out companionship or romance or what you know whatever else all these various forms of love because it is solitude and isolation is i i regard as like one of the most Painful maybe isn't the right word, but it's something that truly does have the largest impact in our life. And which is why even the most isolated individuals find a connection with something. It might be the wider like idea of nature and the circle of life and faith, right? But we all we as people and have always searched for connection. Yeah. I mean, I think the nature of being social animals mm-hmm. is that we can it's impossible for us to be wholly ourselves without the participation of other people. Mm-hmm. Um you know, You cannot be yourself in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Um, You have to be yourself in relation to community and those around you. You find yourself through others' eyes, as it were, Um, through clashing with other people, Mm -hmm. through connecting with other people. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add as well that I think like the sort of overlapping boundaries of different types of love that we have in Thomas... um, I think makes it universal in a way that a lot of stories that cover these types of themes about, you know, the inevitability of love mm. and the necessity of love, because because it's not like defining these relationships. Yeah. You know, there are very much people out there who you know uh, have no interest in romantic mm-hmm. pairing mm-hmm. or sexual love or sexual intimacy. Um, or who might have complicated feelings regarding, uh, say, family. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
this book is just going and being like, but we all need love. Mm -hmm. You know, (laughs) we all need love. We need people who love us and we need to love other people. And that can look like a lot of different things, but you know, at the end of the day, to connect with another person, that's all the same amour, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's it's positing that all of this comes from the same source of we're lonely, and so we seek other people. Yeah. <laughs> For other things about this book, you know, we've waxed poetic about Hagia's art. Uh, many a time, many go a check times. out our podcast episode on Hagio. Um, and uh, yeah, for more of the history about the book, maybe check out our Year 24 podcast. Mm-hmm. But I just really wanted to have a nice, succinct conversation about this particular book in specific. Mm-hmm. Uh, not in relation to our larger body of work. Uh, not in relation to like manga as a whole, but just, you know, going through and talking about uh, this book that has meant so much to me personally mm-hmm. and has meant so much to so many people. Mm-hmm. I mean, so much so that it it helped establish what is ostensibly one of the largest genres in manga mm-hmm. now, now. I mean... People may argue the semantics on that, but I I think BL and and shoujo manga would not be where it is today without this this particular work. Um, Mm -hmm. Plus, as as mentioned, we've talked about the series a lot. What better title to give the our our anniversary spot to than one that does mean so much to our to both the hosts um but most notably ray um Uh, and also ostensibly it's my birth month (laughs) also ostensibly a title that i think needs or deserves a nuanced and in-depth discussion about these topics in english um, because it is so rare that we get 70s shoujo, classic shoujo anyway. Um, and the fact that this one was one of the first, especially of this current era of manga, to get licensed and released um, in such a beautiful edition um, deserves to be celebrated. Mm-hmm. And with that, yep, we come to the end of this of this <laughs> this podcast, this episode. Um, thank you, everyone who sent your wonderful well wishes for the fourth anniversary. Um, for next month, Ray and I will be doing a genre spotlight, which is exciting. Uh, she and I will be talking about mystery manga, so be sure to send in your questions about that. Um, that I'm looking forward to reading a lot of a lot of things. Some that I am already familiar with, others that um, I haven't had the chance to dive into. Um, but yes, mm-hmm. be sure to send us your questions either on. T- my Twitter at G underscore reads. That's G double E underscore reads. Um, you can also find Ray on Twitter. It's still around, just um, it's it's <laughs> creaking to a slow death, but we we will remain until <laughs> they physically have to kick us off. Um, but you yep. can find her at Whimsical Picks. That's P I X, all one word. Um, you can all find this podcast on all of our the wonderful podcasting platforms out there: Spotify, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, um, Stitcher. So be sure to yes. follow us on any of those, as well as on YouTube. Um, my YouTube channel, Simply G. Um, if you enjoy 
either this episode or previous episodes, let us know. Please tell us. We appre- give us a rating. Give us a rating. Give <laughs> us a review. We appreciate all of them. Um, we are... <laughs> like, give us a comment. Yes. Wherever you are. Yes. Because uh, we do read them all. and Looking to get some more ratings up there. So, would love it if you just hit the little button. <laughs> and thank you for everyone who already is following us on all the various podcasting platforms we have so many regular listeners that i am quite shocked um and thank you everyone for (laughs) making the past four years so successful (laughs) this this um (laughs) i guess um, idea between the two of us uh, really grew its own um personality (laughs) to much larger than what we ever expected um but yeah Have a wonderful... It's been fun. It's it's fun, and we will see you in the next month. Bye till then. Bye, guys.